Just six months ago, it was possible to see and hear a train rumbling along at a good speed through the northeastern Kentucky hills, but no more. Economic realities of this area have forever transformed the trains, the track, and the activities associated with railroading into memories. In this documentary, we'll look at the beginnings of the Lexington subdivision, glance at a passenger service on the line, and follow a CNO train from Ashland to Winchester during the final months before this portion of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad was removed. What became the Lexington subdivision was completed in 1881. The track followed an almost direct route west from Ashland through Olive Hill, Moorhead, Mount Sterling, Winchester, and terminated in Lexington. Trackage rights over the Louisville and Nashville Railroad gained in 1895 allowed CNO service to Louisville. Whether the destination was just across the county line or in a different state, the railroad was the way, indeed the only way, to arrive within a respectable period of time. The nation's capital was only 20 hours from Moorhead. Up until the turn of the century, local passenger trains would stop at every little community along the way, but you had to request the stop. Many students of Moorhead State College, now Moorhead State University, rode daily to and from their classes. To many Kentuckians, style and luxury in traveling were important considerations, and the CNO satisfied this need with excellent service, which reached its climax during the 30s. Service from the CNO was as important patrons expected, stylish, efficient, gracious, courteous to a fault, and given amidst the most finely appointed equipment that could be found. World War II brought an end to such extravagant service which was never again seen on this line. Service remained first class, though, through May 1, 1971, when the hills of northeastern Kentucky were graced by the passage of the George Washington for the final time. On that date, federally subsidized Amtrak took over control of all passenger trains deemed economically justifiable. The George Washington was not one of the few chosen. In 1974, the Kentucky General Assembly studied the possibility of Amtrak serving Kentucky east and west along a route including the Lexington subdivision. Despite the need for efficient public transportation from one end of the state to the other, the proposition was dismissed as not being feasible at the time. Two of the more famous passengers of the line included Harry S. Truman and the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration was sent via the CNO to Fort Knox in anticipation of an attack on the nation's capital during World War II. Harry Truman made a whistle-stop tour of northeastern Kentucky during his election in October of 1948. Here in Ashland, Kentucky, in the shadow of that city's extensive steelworks, is where the Lexington subdivision begins. Ashland, with a population of 27,000, is the largest and most progressive city in eastern Kentucky and is the chief Kentucky unit of this industrial tri-state area. Its manufacturers include steel, coke, brick, and lumber. Nearby are the rich coal fields of the Big Sandy River Valley. This train is CNO Freight number 391, which originated at Chassis Systems nearby classification yards at Russell. The CNO is an operating unit of the Chassis System Railroads. Until several years ago, number 391 was a through freight, stopping only at a few specified points to set out and pick up groups of cars on its westbound journey. In the final years of operation, number 391 was the only westbound on the line and thus did all necessary switching of cars going west. From here, the railroad follows the route of the old Ashland Coal and Iron Company Railroad southwest to Denton a distance of about 25 miles. Along those 25 miles, the rails pass over four watersheds and run through three tunnels. Typical of these three tunnels is the Princess Tunnel located eight miles from Ashland. Originally bored in the 1850s, it was enlarged in the mid-30s to allow for larger locomotives and equipment. Despite this enlargement, trains have been limited to 10 miles per hour to avoid derailments. 
For many years, the northeastern Kentucky clay and fire brick industry gave the CNO considerable business. This discovery of clay usable in brick production led to the establishment of the Olive Hill Fire Brick Company in 1895. By 1950, there were seven brick plants and 11 clay mines being served by the CNO on the Lexington subdivision. Over the past 35 years, though, a decline in the demand for fire brick along with an increase in the use of trucks has contributed to a great reduction in the number of brick products shipped over the railroad. Klein Brick Company's plant, located here at Princess, is one of the two remaining brickyards along the tracks that ship frequently via the railroad. Part of number 391's work today included picking up a carload of brick products. We are now on the portion of track that is to be removed following abandonment. The track will remain intact from Ashland to Colton, about two and a half miles back east from here, to serve Kentucky Electric Steel Company. The Williams Creek area of Boyd and Carter counties was the site of early coal mining activity. As early as the 1860s, coal was being mined in great quantities in this area to satisfy the appetite of the ironworks in Ashland. Few reminders of that mining activity remain today as number 391 accelerates up Williams Creek past the Rush Depot. Williams Creek Tunnel, located at the head of Williams Creek, six miles southwest from here, is the longest of the old AC&I tunnels at 2,003 feet in length. The Rush Depot is one of the few wood structures still standing along the Lexington subdivision, although minus one room. When the west side or end required repair, it was removed to avoid the cost. Most of the wood structures along the line have been demolished, either intentionally or through vandalism. The depot was last used as a freight agency for the railroad in 1983. In the process of fire brick making, two types of clay are needed, plastic clay and flint clay. Both types were found here around 1895. During the late 1940s, the railroad served five, six clay mines between here and Grand, about two and a half miles west. Aden Tunnel, 382 feet in length, was enlarged in the mid-30s to allow for larger railroad equipment. To maintain traffic while the renovation took place, a temporary track was built around the small ridge this tunnel goes through. The roadbed for this temporary track is still evident today. This project was part of a series of improvements along the line between 1934 and 1936. Mountaintop located atop Quarry Hill. Here the railroad climbs out of the Little Sandy River watershed and drops down into the Tigers Creek Valley. Originally a long tunnel at Olive Hill was planned to bypass the steep grade over this hill but CNO President Collis P. Huntington, who remarked that he was tired of building monuments to engineers, favored the least expensive and easiest to construct route. However, the expense of operating trains for 104 years, many requiring two engine over Quarry Hill's 2.6% gradient, would have paid many times the cost of boring through the hill. Olive Hill, population 1,200, is the industrial center of northeastern Kentucky, the center of greatly reduced industrial activity over the past 20 years. Olive Hill Fire Brick Company, the first such plant built in the interior of Kentucky, located here in 1895. The plant became a segment of General Refactories Company in 1913 and closed abruptly in December of 1971. Harbison Walker, another manufacturer of fire brick, installed the plant in 1901. This was shut down in 1964. Presently, Olive Hill is home for numerous light industries, including a textile mill. The town has had its share of disasters. During the Civil War, John Hunt Morgan and his men burned the town to the ground. Major fires in 1915 and 1917 burned portions of the downtown area. The whistles of two CNO locomotives were blown continuously to awaken Olive Hill residents during the 1917 fire. <laughs> Rest
residents have also had to cope with the flooding of the nearby Tigers Creek on numerous occasions. the CNO follows Tigers Creek upstream a distance of just over three miles, crosses that creek, and continues up Soldier Fork here at Limestone, so named after an abandoned limestone quarry. Limestone is also the site of an old keg factory and the long gone Panther Gap Railroad, which brought timber to the factory. During the coal boom of the early 70s, several coal tipples were constructed or enlarged along the CNO to handle the increased coal production. Kenoma Coal Company's tipple here at Silica was one of the largest. It has remained dormant since the late 70s. At nearby Lawton, the railroad served a clay mine, two limestone mines, and the sand excavation until the 1960s. Also at Lawton from 1969 to 1974 was a mushroom farm which received an occasional carload of Kentucky horse track manure. Harvesting of northern Kentucky's hardwoods has long been a cornerstone of this area's economy as well as a source of business for the CNO. Feeding the CNO around the turn of the century were numerous railroads, built up hollows and small tributaries. Such railroads as the Kentucky Northern and the Triplet and Big Sandy Railroads certainly had ambitious names, but they merely performed their one track duty of hauling timber. When their reason for being was exhausted, they were promptly removed, the track often being used in similar applications elsewhere. Today, forests still provide work for many people in the area. Local timber products are shipped around the world, but toward the end of the CNO service to this area, very few of these products began their trek from mill to market on the Lexington subdivision. Here at Enterprise, gondolas are loaded with railroad ties being purchased from the Southern Wood Piedmont Company by the CNO and are picked up by number 391. In the final years of operation, the CNO ran trains over the Lexington subdivision only three times a week east and west. The postmaster at Soldier took a break from her work today to take in the passage of one of those infrequent runs. Carter County's smallest brick clan, Ashland Fire Brick, later part of Northern American's refractories, located near here at Hayward in 1900. It was shut down in 1958. long cut was excavated in the mid-30s to eliminate a curving section of track and a 2,600-foot timber-lined tunnel.
Kentucky, located just around the curve from Soldier and barely in Round County, was named for a president of the Kentucky Fire Brick Company, which located here around 1915. Holloman was a town complete with a high school, two stores, and several smaller shops. The number one plant operated until the 1940s and the number two plant operated until the early 1950s occupied the valley while the employees' homes were located on the neighboring hillsides. In 1936, the plants had total capacity of 18 million bricks and employed 264 men. Moorhead is the county seat of Round County, the origin of the abandoned Moorhead and North Fork Railroad, and of course, home for Moorhead State University. From an operating standpoint, Moorhead was conveniently located on the railroad. Until the late 70s, the crews of the East Local from Lexington and the West Local from Ashland would meet here. After laying over in bunks on the second floor of the freight station, they would head back the next day to their point of origin with the other crew's train. The freight station now houses a liquor store. This structure is one of two remaining examples of a freight station along this line. The Moorhead State University power plant received its last shipment of coal by the CNO in December of 1979. The plant produces steam for heating university facilities. Local conflicts were numerous in the early history of this area and the CNO did not pass through oblivious to nor was it untouched by domestic bickering. The Martin Tolliver Logan feud was one of the longer and bloodier of these conflicts. The final clash of the feud took place in 1887 in the area that this depot now occupies. Having left the rugged hills behind at Moorhead, the tracks of the CNO crossed the valley of the Licking River and crossed the river itself here at Farmer. Jesse Stewart once wrote that when riding west on this line, Preston is where perhaps the bluegrass country officially begins. Who could argue with him? The hills of the Cumberland Plateau and the beginnings of the bluegrass in the foreground make for a beautiful transition. On this day, number 391 pauses to pick up several loads of railroad ties. The swapping of tails on the front porch of the local general store is hardly disrupted as the crew of number 391 go about their work and then leave Preston to take care of work further west. Mount Sterling, population 4,300, is the county seat of Montgomery County. First surveyed and plotted in 1793, it was known as Little Mountain Town because of an adjacent interesting Indian mound excavated in 1846. From this mound comes the mount in the present name. Accounts differ as to whether Sterling came from a local landowner or the boyhood home of a Scot who resided on this site. Principal industries here are tobacco, canning, and timber products. During the 60s, the CNO would run trains several times a week between Lexington and here during the tobacco season made up entirely of cars carrying tobacco. This was done to serve the Kelly and the Clay Tobacco Warehouses here in Mount Sterling. This scrapyard, the last steady customer for the CNO here, is on the site where the Kentucky and South Atlantic Railroad branched off the CNO and headed south 19 and a half miles to Rothwell in Menifee County. Originally the narrow gauge to Mount Sterling Coal Road, it became the Kentucky and South Atlantic in 1882. The CNO took control of the road in 1892 and widened the rails to standard gauge in 1895. The development of a small oil field postponed suspension of service until 1931. The track was removed in 1933.
at Winchester, the CNO crossed over the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. From here, the CNO's trains followed a direct route to Lexington and via trackage rights over the L&N to Louisville. Soon after both railroads came under the common corporate leadership of CSX Corporation, the CNO tracks from Winchester to Lexington were removed in favor of the L&N line parallel to the CNO that served the Lexington Bluegrass Army Depot. The Winchester Passenger Depot, which served the L&N as well as the CNO, stood to the left of the CNO tracks and just this side of the L&N. The station, a classic CNO Georgian style building, was built in 1907 and removed by the L&N suddenly in 1981. Since 1981, Winchester had been the end of the line for westbound CNO trains. Number 391 usually would arrive here at the L&N's patio yard in Winchester in the early afternoon on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. After taking care of any necessary switching of cars, the crew would lay over at a local motel. Early the next morning, the crew would return east to Ashland with the same engines and caboose with train number 392. On June 1, 1985, the line was embargoed and the final scheduled train movement over the Lexington subdivision took place on June 28. The first step of dismantling the railroad was removing the communication and signal equipment. This began in August and was completed in late October. Track removal began on October 15 in Winchester. CNO crews removed the rails in train length sections and hauled them to the railroad's rail facility at Russell. The ties that supported the rails were removed later by a contractor with many of the ties marked for return to the CNO and the rest to be hauled away by the contractor. The CNO's retreat from the interior of Kentucky was expected to be completed at Colton, 11 miles west of Ashland by the 1st of March, 1986. We would be cheating history if we said this line did not contribute to the development of northeastern Kentucky. The CNO, through their Lexington subdivision, provided outlets to the east and to the west for the area's coal, timber, and clay resources, as well as finished products, including fire brick and lumber. But as time goes by, people won't remember the influence of the railroad on area economics as much as they will recall the reassuring passage of a train through their town. The trains have become memories now, memories preserved in the pictures for future generations.